Path of Exile is unique in the ARPG and dungeon crawler genre for many reasons, such as an extreme amount of character customization through the passive tree and skill gems, the currency system, and constant updates through varied and in-depth expansions and challenge leagues multiple times per year. However, what I would say is the bread and butter that puts Path of Exile above and beyond its competition is the absolutely breathtakingly expansive in-game mapping and atlas system. Now if you're new to Path of Exile and have just finished the campaign and opened up the atlas for the first time, you might be getting PTSD flashbacks of the first time you open the skill tree, but fear not. With this extensive guide to mapping and the atlas, you too will be conquering the Elder Slayers in no time. Remember, if this guide helps you out, the best way you can help yourself and me is to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It lets me know what kind of videos you want to see more of in the future. Also, I stream on Twitch in the evenings at twitch.tv slash bigducks, so if you want to see examples of in-game content, you can find links to my stream, Discord server, and Twitter in the description down below. Also, before we begin, there are timestamps to each individual section of the guide that you see listed on your screen in the description of this video. Once you've finished the campaign in Path of Exile and liberated Rayclass from the evils you just so happened to release upon it in the first place, you end up in a hideout of your choosing with a bunch of scary looking dudes surrounding you all looking at you like that guy that stands outside of Walmart asking for a dollar. So as your only option of escape, you grab onto that little tablet you found that just happens to have what looks like a crude map of a beach scrawled on it. And with a dream and a prayer, you slam it into this strange device that just happens to be nearby, hoping it will take you to your long-awaited beach vacation where you'll sip on margaritas and soak in the sun, only to find out that the same exact monsters that have been chasing you this entire time are here as well. But they're stronger, smarter, and far more dangerous than anything you've seen so far. There also seems to be others like you trapped in this realm. This is the Atlas of Worlds. So before we begin, I'd like to open with a clip from one of the greatest minds of all time. I can't believe it's all over. What do we do now? What do you mean? Now we can finally play the game. Oh yeah! Ever since I was a kid, I've always really enjoyed games that just have endless amounts of customization to them and very deep depths of content that you can get into. That's why I played World of Warcraft for so many years. I was even a raid leader for my guild for a lot of that time as well. And Path of Exile just happens to scratch that itch. It gives you this giant sandbox that you can basically play in. You can do content that's as easy as you want or as hard as you want, and this is mainly done through the mapping and in-game systems. So if you're looking for that giant sandbox of your own creation where you can slay monsters and gods alike, then the Atlas is where you want to be. I'd like to suggest a few tools that you would do well to learn before starting your journey into the depths of the Atlas. I'll give you a brief description here, but the pages themselves have tutorials available if the functions aren't self-explanatory. A loot filter from filterblade.xyz. A loot filter will, well, filter the loot that you see and will give you a rough idea on the items that you're supposed to pick up. I suggest selecting the details panel and deciding what sounds like your level of progression and just going with that. You can also customize the colors, among other things. This isn't really a tool, but is highly suggested for making your life significantly easier when it comes to mapping. Buy a map stash tab from the shop. If I can suggest anything in this game to spend real life money on, it's the specific stash tabs that allow you to easily sort your items. You'll thank me later. The official trading tool from Grinding Gear Games in recent time is by far the most up-to-date and consistent tool available. It allows you to search for items of any kind, including maps, in case there are specific maps that you'd like to buy that you haven't been able to find. It also allows you to trade currency for rolling your maps, which we'll get into a little later on. PoeMap.Live is a resource dedicated to trading the maps you have for other maps instead of purchasing them for currency. This can be useful for filling out portions of the atlas with maps from the same tier that you haven't unlocked yet. PoE Trade Search. This is my personal choice of trade macro. This tool allows you to hit a button combination while hovering over an item, and it'll provide you with tons of information about that item, such as the DPS, the individual roles of the item, as well as giving you an estimate on its worth. This one will save you a ton of time, so I suggest getting this or something similar. 
If you want a build that can definitely progress through the endgame as of 3.9, feel free to take a look at my previous video detailing endgame viable builds. There should be a link right now up at the top right corner of this video. Note that if you're watching this video after 3.9 is concluded, some of these builds may not be fully functional. If you don't want to use any of the builds listed, and you're a new player, I suggest that you look on the forums for a guide explaining a build that looks like fun to you, and going from there. You can create your own build, but if you're very new, do so at your own risk. My suggestions on choosing a build for a first time player would be to choose something quite tanky that's life based, with easy to use abilities such as Cyclone or any ranged spell for the most part. By the time you reach endgame you should find at least a handful of map items scattered around Rayclast. If you remember the device you used to find the Melagaro boss fight, the concept here is the same. Take a map from your inventory, insert it into the map device, and six portals will open to the map described in the tooltip. Keep in mind that you only get six chances to complete whatever you are entering this map to do. If you fail all six times, or leave the map six times to drop off loop, you won't be able to return to that specific instance of the map and will have to open a new one. After opening the map, it functions similar to any other portion of the game. You run around and kill some monsters. However, in every map there is a boss encounter of some kind, and to complete the map you must defeat this boss. There are, as of this recording, 154 different maps, each with unique bosses and layouts for you to explore and conquer, as well as a handful of powerful endgame bosses that sometimes require special combinations of map fragments or certain circumstances to unlock. The Atlas can be quite intimidating upon looking at it for the first time, and it may seem impossible to fully conquer, but fortunately for you, I'm going to give you the basic information you need to be able to complete every single map on the entire Atlas and unlock the endgame bosses. And this begins with unlocking the maps themselves. As I said previously, before you slap up Kitaba and save Rayclass, you should find a few maps to begin your Atlas with. You'll notice that these maps have an indicator on them called Map Tier. This correlates with the level of the monsters that you're going to find in the map. Starting out at Tier 1, you'll encounter monsters of level 68, going all the way up to Tier 16, which will have you facing monsters of level 83. Beyond the base number of tiers the maps themselves have, they're also separated by color tiers. There are four colors of maps, white which contains map tiers 1 through 5, yellow which contains 6 through 10, red which contains 11 through 16, and unique maps which can be of any tier and are generally filled with unique content of many kinds, such as survival modes, boss rushes, or even a map where you open a bunch of chests filled with items, although to be honest, the items aren't that great. These colors are important because they determine when the modifiers that can affect your map will jump in difficulty. The higher you go in tiers, the more difficult and unforgiving these modifiers get, but more on that in a little bit. The basic way of progressing through the atlas is to open up a portal to the map of your choice and attempt to kill as many monsters as you can, including the final boss. Maps of up to one tier higher can drop from any monster within the map, and maps of two tiers higher can drop from the unique boss of the area. Keep in mind that maps that are directly connected to your current map as shown in the atlas have a much higher chance of dropping, and maps that are not connected and still currently grayed out cannot drop for you in any way. Once a map is completed, it can drop in any area following the rules I stated before. However, if you take a look at the maps on the atlas, you'll see an indicator in the middle giving you an idea of what your goal is. The more maps that you complete with the given conditions, the higher chance for high level maps to drop becomes. So if you take a look at the maps on the atlas, you'll see a few indicators on how to gain the bonuses I spoke of previously, and that involves using currency to roll more difficult versions of the maps. You'll hear many different opinions on this subject, and I know that I'm going to get a thousand comments telling me that I'm wrong, but the method that has worked for me and let me complete the atlas and endgame bosses every league for years now, and is a good balance of difficulty versus reward, is as follows. White maps, you transmute and augment, which will give you a blue map with two modifiers at max. On yellow maps, you can use an orb of alchemy to roll the map is rare. This will provide it up to six modifiers which will substantially increase the difficulty. Finally, with red maps I suggest that if the map is tier 14 or higher, you use four chisels on the map while it is unmodified, which will give you an additional 20% quantity of items dropped. You can use chisels on all red maps, but I don't suggest it on anything below 14. After that, use an orb of alchemy on the map. If the map rolls extremely well with high levels of item quantity and pack size, more on those terms in another section of the video, and you do not need to corrupt it for a bonus objective, then the rolling is complete. If the map rolled with modifiers you absolutely can't do, I suggest doing one of a few things. You can either corrupt the map with a vol orb and hope that the rolls change, if they don't you can save that map for a different character. Or if you intend to do the map on the character you're playing, I suggest you re-roll it either by using a chaos orb or scouring the map and then rolling again with an alchemy orb. However, if the map rolled with poor modifiers and low quantity and pack size, or you need a bonus objective, I suggest corrupting the map with a vol orb and running whatever the outcome is if you can. That is the very, very basic rolling method for running maps. However, going a bit deeper 
deeper, there are a few more things you can do to juice up your maps and make them far more lucrative. For very high tier red maps, you can insert sacrifice fragments to add additional quantity of items dropped to the map. I generally suggest only using Dusk, Dawn, and Noon fragments, in that order. Midnights are difficult to come by, and you should save them for running at Ziri or for selling. For maps that are extremely well rolled, or if you're trying to farm for a very specific outcome, you can include items called scarabs which do very specific things. You can read more about what individual scarabs do on the scarab items themselves. Another option is to take the maps to the master of your choice and run their mission that you earn over the course of running maps. I'll be making a video entirely dedicated to the masters and their different gameplay and areas in the future, so if you're in the future and you're interested in more info, I'll link that video at the top right corner now. And if that video is out and I forgot to put the link, let me know on Twitter or Discord and I'll get that fixed. Thanks, boys. The last option when it comes to currency is called sextants. These add special modifiers to a watchstone for any map run in that region. These in general are reserved for very late into progression, but you can use them at any time. As for watchstones, those will be explained in another section of the video. A quick tip as well on getting maps that you haven't unlocked. Orbs of Horizons are great for getting maps you haven't found yet and are an easy and quick way to spread your reach on the Atlas. Map modifiers are one of the most important bits of information that you have to take into account when rolling a map. The basic idea is that just like items in the game, maps can roll prefixes and suffixes of various types. Depending on the previous mentioned color tiers, there are certain map modifiers to look out for as they may impact your map running in various ways. Before we go into specific modifiers, one of the most important bits of information that I can give you on properly rolling maps is to pay close attention to the quantity and pack size modifiers towards the top of the map tooltip. Rarity is almost completely irrelevant in rolling maps, as it does not affect the amount of currency or map drops that you'll obtain. The most important of these is pack size. It should make sense that more monsters to kill will result in more items. There are also modifiers that do not directly influence the pack size percentage, but do influence the amount of mobs that are available to kill. The ones to keep an eye out for are, slaying enemies close together has a chance to attract monsters from beyond, magic monster packs each have a bloodline mod, and rare monsters each have a nemesis mod. These may look familiar if you've taken a look at Zana's map device. As you progress through the Atlas, she'll unlock more options for rolling maps. As a base rule, I suggest that if the map does not have bloodlines, roll bloodlines. If it does have bloodlines, roll beyond. If it happens to have both of those things, roll nemesis. If for some reason you have a map that has absolutely all of these and is high tier, I would suggest rolling legion on the map. I'll go more in depth on this in the masters video I spoke about earlier. The next most important number is item quantity. It increases the amount of items that drop from the map, if it wasn't obvious that more items equals better. Moving into the specific modifiers to look out for. Note, for some people this section will not be useful, but for very, very new players, take a look at the mods that I've listed here and keep an eye out for them. Starting with modifiers that can affect all maps, some things to look out for are, area is inhabited by ranged monsters. This one in particular is only dangerous when coupled with other modifiers such as monsters fire additional projectiles. But when the mods are loaded up for these creatures, you can get off screen from 100 to zero and not even realize it happened area contains many totems. There are a few totems which can be heavily dangerous, such as diamond totems that give 100% crit chance to all nearby allies, detonate dead totems, which I'm not actually sure exist anymore, I haven't seen them in quite some time, but they did exist at one point, and totems that make nearby allies immune to death. Area contains two unique bosses. In some cases, this modifier can make boss fights significantly more difficult, so be warned in certain encounters. It also means that maps with already multiple bosses will contain double the amount of bosses, so if there are three unique bosses for a map, there will be six with this modifier. In general, this is a very good mod to have when it comes to map progression and drops, but just be aware of the difficulty increase in some cases. And finally, monster's action speed cannot be modified below a base value. If your build relies on temp chains or chill and freeze as a defensive mechanic, these monsters cannot be frozen and cannot be slowed below a certain amount. The next set of modifiers are generally doable by most builds, but may make your clear speed or boss killing significantly slower. Depending on the color tier of the map, these modifiers can be significantly more impactful, so keep that in mind. Mind. Monsters have more life, monster physical damage reduction, monster chaos or elemental resistances, monsters have a chance to avoid poison, blind, or bleeding, monsters have a chance to avoid elemental ailments. This one in particular is especially significant for builds based around ignite as it removes a vast majority of your damage. And monsters take reduced extra damage from critical strikes. All of these modifiers will significantly reduce your ability to clear, so keep that in mind if your goal is to clear maps quickly. This next set of modifiers poses a significant threat or potentially makes you unable to run the map at all. 
In all tiers of maps you can find, monsters reflect physical or elemental damage. For most builds, this is a strict do not run unless you have some form of immunity to reflect or a way to instantly leech or regenerate. Monsters have increased critical strike chance and critical strike multiplier. Players have less recovery rate of life and energy shield. This mod significantly affects regeneration based builds. Area has patches of shocking or desecrated ground. These are the two much more dangerous ones, but burning and chilled ground exist as well. Players have reduced chance to block and less armor. And finally, players chance to dodge is unlucky. Of note, the unlucky modifier means that the roll that happens to determine if you've dodged or not will roll twice if the first roll lands on dodge. In mid-tier or yellow maps, you can find additional modifiers. Players are cursed with elemental weakness, vulnerability, and feeble or temp chains. Players cannot regenerate life, mana, or energy shield. Of note, recharge of energy shield, which is the quick heal you see occasionally after taking damage, still works here. Also, life and mana is still able to be obtained from flasks. And finally, players have reduced maximum resistances. This mod is significantly more dangerous in maps that also contain monsters deal extra damage as fire, cold, or lightning. Finally, in high tier or red maps, you can also find the modifier Cannot Leech Life or Mana from Monsters. These modifiers listed are the most impactful ones in my opinion, but there are rare circumstances and combinations of modifiers that can cause extremely difficult situations, so always take into account the way that modifiers interact with each other. Immediately upon finishing the quest chain that you receive from Kirik, you will notice that the first quest line within the Atlas is to find his brother Baron. This is the quest line that will lead us to the ultimate fight at the end of the Atlas. However, before we get ahead of ourselves, let's explain a bit about who and what the Elder Slayers are. In a time before Conquerors of the Atlas, the landscape of the endgame was vastly different. Instead of there being Elder Slayers as our foes, players were, in fact, the exiles who entered the Atlas with Zana to attempt to save her father the Shaper, and defeat once and for all the Beacon of Decay that is called the Elder. Nowadays, the Elder has been sealed away, and these fights, while still available through certain map pieces that can drop, are no longer considered the in-game content of the Atlas. Although, I might consider the Uber Elder fight to still be the most difficult encounter available in the game at this time from a pure difficulty standpoint. The exiles that accompanied Zana on her mission started to lose their sanity, they became twisted and corrupted, and developed projections that granted them great power. Now, let's be honest for a moment, somebody at GGG really likes JoJo because these projections look a little familiar, don't they? There will be story spoilers for Conquerors of the Atlas going forward from this point. I'll attempt to minimize them, but with the nature of the topic, some things may be spoiled. The Atlas itself, in its infancy, will be smaller and filled with only white tier maps. As you travel and explore, you'll begin to encounter the Elder Slayers and their citadels scattered throughout the Atlas. Upon encountering an Elder Slayer, that zone will be taken over by them, and you'll need to run multiple maps influenced by that specific Elder Slayer within their zone to spawn the final encounter with them, offered to you as a quest from Kirik and Zana. Zana will open a new map where you must defeat the final boss of the area to spawn a portal to a unique boss encounter for each of the Elder Slayers. Upon slaying that Elder Slayer, a Watchstone will drop if one is available for that region. To determine if a Watchstone is available, mouse over the square section to the left of the Atlas page for more information. Once you have this Watchstone, you can insert it into the various citadels available throughout the Atlas to raise the tier and difficulty of all maps within that area and to unlock additional higher tier only maps available for that region. Once you've collected four different colored watchstones and slotted them into the same region, you'll notice a number in the middle of the atlas. This is called awakening level and can scale all the way to eight. Each awakening level you achieve will make running maps significantly harder and simultaneously more lucrative. This, along with the Zana missions, are the only way to access the previous in-game content of the Shaper, Elder, and Uber Elder fights. Now that you understand what the Watchstones are, which is quite terrifying when you look into the lore of them, it's time to go more in-depth on the Elder Slayers themselves and their individual encounters. The Hunter influence and fight is based around physical and chaos damage, mainly in the form of poison. His influence will cause giant snake heads and poison themed enemies to spawn, as well as enable Hunter influence items that can drop with special modifiers unique to the Hunter. The fight with Al Hesman consists of two phases. The fight begins in a rest phase, where you'll have a little bit of time to learn his basic attacks, which consists of a few melee attacks which can knock back, and also various ranged abilities which will be used if you're at a distance from him. Most of these abilities do not have obvious animations, and I suggest moving to the side for each ability if you're not playing a very tanky build. It's a little bit difficult to tell which attacks that he's doing, so I don't have a good list of them available. He's also able to swiftly dodge as well as travel quickly through the room, so movement speed is important in this fight. The first of two phases in this fight is when the center of the arena fills with poisonous ground. Avoiding this ground is simple, but Al Hesman can move quickly around the arena, so making sure you don't touch this area can be difficult at times. The second of the two phases is when the outer ring will fill with snake heads if you approach it. These are similar to the ones you see spawn in maps influenced by the hunter, but these snakes only have a melee bite attack, so avoid 
avoid him moving towards the outside of the arena. Upon killing the hunter, you'll be rewarded with a Viridian Watchstone if one is available to drop from that region, as well as the possibility of a Hunter's Exalted Orb, one of the various Awakened Support Gems, or a pool of uniques shared between the Conquerors. The Redeemer influence and fight are based around physical and cold damage with the associated effects of chill and freezing. Her influence will cause various cold-based enemies to spawn, as well as enable Redeemer influence items that can drop with special modifiers, unique to the Redeemer. The fight with Veritania happens on top of a circular tower and consists of a single phase. During this encounter, there will be a storm raging around you that slowly creeps in the lower the Redeemer's health becomes. Beyond this, there are only a few abilities worth noting. She has a frontal wave-based attack that she'll use consistently throughout the fight, as well as a targeted barrage attack that will follow you as you move. Beyond this, there are only two other abilities to look out for. Occasionally, she'll form a circle around her that will spawn tornadoes that move outwards from her. The other ability is quite dangerous. Occasionally, she will fly up into the sky and sweep across the arena, leaving a trail of ice that has significantly boosted freeze time. Also, upon landing, she will do a slam ability. This ability is very dangerous, and I do suggest bringing along some form of freeze immunity to this fight. Upon killing the Redeemer, you'll be rewarded with a Cobalt Watchstone if one is available to drop from that region, as well as the possibility of a Redeemer's Exalted Orb, one of the various Awakened Support Gems, or a pool of uniques shared between the Conquerors. The Warlord influence and fight are based around pure physical damage. For most builds, this makes him by far the deadliest when it comes to damage done. His influence will cause various physical-based enemies and banners to spawn, as well as enable Warlord influence items that can drop unique to the Warlord. The fight with Drox happens in a cross-shaped arena with four gates at each end, and consists of two phases. The first phase is the general fight, and will contain every attack that he's going to use against you. He has a frontal swipe which deals very heavy physical damage that he uses consistently, and while he is attacking you there will also be numerous attacks that come from large fists positioned throughout the arena. These attacks consist of a slam ability that will be accompanied by one of a few specific voice lines, either or and two other attacks that are based within the corridors on the sides of the arena. These have very obvious indicators, so look for giant fists positioned on either side. In addition to his other attacks, there will be minions constantly spawning for the duration of the fight, as well as the main mechanic, which is banners that will be consistently placed in specific locations during the fight. Some of these banners do heavy physical damage upon being placed, so be aware. These banners cause all enemies within their range to be completely immune to damage. They are the number one priority to clear if enemies are within them. The second phase of this fight happens only occasionally. I generally only see it one time during the duration of the fight. It may be health gated, but I'm not 100% positive. Drox will summon what looks like a large large shield with a banner around him. During this phase, minions will spawn and he'll take significantly reduced damage, but most other mechanics in the fight will cease. Use this time to do as much damage as you can. Upon killing the Warlord, you'll be rewarded with a Golden Watchstone if one is available to drop from that region, as well as the possibility of a Warlord's Exalted Orb, one of the various Awakened Support Gems, or a pool of uniques shared between the Conquerors. The Crusader influence and fight are based around physical and lightning damage. His influence will spawn various lightning-based enemies as well as large runes that appear on the floor. While standing in these runes, you take damage over time and lose mana. His influence also enables Crusader influence items that can drop unique to the Crusader. The fight with Baron is very straightforward, and he has very few abilities. There are runes positioned throughout the large square arena that when lit up deal damage over time and drain your mana. The main focus of this fight is avoiding standing in these. Sometimes the entire arena can be filled up it seems, so bring a movement ability that allows you to jump over things. Along with this, he has a dash ability that deals no damage, as well as beams that he'll shoot out at you throughout the fight. Note that the beams do damage with all portions of the ability, the beam itself, as well as the area on the ground it hits, and the subsequent explosion that happens afterwards can all damage you. The beams can also shotgun, so do not run directly at him at any time. Move around him in circles if possible. He also has a slam ability, but he only casts this occasionally. Upon killing the Crusader, you'll be rewarded with a Crimson Watchstone, if one is available to drop from that region, as well as the possibility of a Crusader's Exalted Orb, one of the various Awakened Support Gems, or a unique pool shared between the Conquerors. And ultimately, upon obtaining 20 Watchstones, you will unlock the ultimate in-game encounter with Cirrus, the Awakener of Worlds. Cirrus is the final fight of the Atlas, and also by far the most difficult and complicated fight among the Elder Slayers. His fight does physical, fire, cold, lightning, and chaos damage, sometimes simultaneously. There are many abilities in this fight, so I'm going to format the abilities into when and where he uses them. When you first enter the fight, you'll notice large storms located throughout the arena. These storms are static and do massive amounts of damage when standing near or inside them. Additionally, during the main part of the fight, if you exit the circle that Cirrus creates upon aggroing, a new storm that will slowly move will appear in the middle. 
This also happens at certain health percentages throughout the fight and will indicate when you've moved to a new phase. When this happens, move away from the storm and allow him to slowly move towards the stairs on the left of the arena until you can stand directly underneath him, which will cause him to begin the fight once again. This fight is quite long with many different abilities that get significantly more powerful and deadly as the fight progresses. There are five phases to this fight, four main phases and the air phase in between those phases. Starting with the phase where Cirrus is in the air, the goal of this portion is to dodge any abilities he uses against you while attempting to get directly underneath him to begin the next phase of the fight. While Cirrus sits comfortably in his nice throne, his projection will be using a variety of abilities during this phase. Meteors that fall from the sky, geysers that appear underneath your feet, and a double beam that sweeps in from either side meeting in the middle and doing a slam type explosion. In phase 1, Cirrus is on the ground while his projection is in the air continuing to use the meteor, geyser, and double beam attacks. Cirrus himself will do a consistent single beam attack that causes physical damage, and every 8 to 10 seconds will do a channeled beam that deals fire, cold, and lightning damage sequentially. After saying the word, Die. Fortunately, during this fight, almost every single one of his deadly attacks is accompanied by a specific voice line, so turn your sound up if you're having issues avoiding them. He'll also do the first of his maze abilities, where he moves you to the center of the area and spawns a circle maze wall, with a glowing red and white animation where the exit is. This is kind of difficult to see if you have any minions, as you'll see in my example videos here, so keep that in mind. After a short period, a meteor will fall, most likely killing you. Keep in mind that one second after you leave the circle, the meteor will fall regardless, so don't accidentally walk back into the circle. This phase continues until 75% health, at which time Cirrus will ascend back into the air and you must repeat the air phase until phase 2 begins. In phase 2, the only addition that I'm aware of is the corridor. You simply have to run towards Cirrus and through him before he casts the orb. This ability is accompanied by the sound clip. This phase continues until 50% health, at which time Cirrus will ascend back into the air and you must repeat the air phase until phase 3 begins. In phase 3, most of the abilities of the projection in the air are now more deadly. They do more damage and have longer lasting effects while also being more numerous. Cirrus retains all of his previous abilities while also improving upon the maze. The maze now lasts slightly longer, but you must escape two concentric circles with random positions for exits. This phase continues until 25% health, at which time Cirrus will ascend back into the air and you must repeat the air phase again until phase 4 begins. In phase 4, Cirrus absorbs the power of his stand, I, I mean projection, which heals him back to half health and causes him to gain completely new abilities. This is where the fight truly begins. Due to Cirrus absorbing his projection, the abilities that the projection was using from the sky are no longer present. However, all of the abilities Cirrus himself was using before are still present. His charge beam will now do a sweeping motion across the arena. It's important to stay as close to Cirrus as possible at all times so that this ability is easier to dodge. The maze now has three concentric circles in a slightly longer duration. Focus on finding the outermost exit and save movement skills for this section. As for new abilities, Cirrus will create copies of himself which charge four beams into an explosion in the middle. This explosion does damage and once it has gone off causes a large rotating four-way laser beam that does low damage and persists for some time. He'll also perform a similar trick where he creates many copies and then casts a beam similar to his earlier phases that can come from any angle. Attempt to find the real Cirrus during this phase and be ready. He has two voice lines that he'll say during this phase. You will long for beam non-existence. Feel the thrill of beam the void. I said beam, where the beam will be. Also keep in mind that this is probably one of the hardest abilities to dodge in the entire game, just because it's seemingly random where it comes from. If you're gonna die to anything, it's most likely this attack. Upon killing the Awakener, you'll be rewarded with a guaranteed unique from a pool exclusive to Cirrus, as well as a chance at an Awakener's Orb, one of the various Awakened support gems, and unique ivory watchstones with varying effects that can replace any of the watchstones from the other Elder Slayers. And with that, you'll have completed the final encounter within the Atlas. From here, you can work on finishing your watchstone progression, and, upon achieving Awakener level 8, can fight Cirrus at his highest power. You can also work on getting full Atlas completion and exploring the Shaper, Elder, and Uber Elder fights, as well as any other boss fights throughout the endgame. And that is, if not all, most of the information you need to be able to work your way from start to finish within the Atlas. I want to remind everyone that things may change over time, so if you're in the distant future, you may need to do as I suggest everyone do with all aspects of this game, do more research. Learning more about the depth this game has to offer is one of the most entertaining factors for me when it comes to Path of Exile. If I missed anything, or you have any ideas for a video I can do in the future, be sure to let me know in the comments, and I'll respond as best I can. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel if this video helped you out. But that's going to be it for me, so I'll see you guys in the next video.